Well, it's interesting that I had a very atheistic background. I had absolutely no exposure to religion in my childhood, actually. We had classes of religion, but for me this was a time of leisure. And then from this uh, kind of background I went to the medical school. It certainly doesn't cultivate uh, mystical awareness. And in addition, this was uh, at a time when we were controlled by the Soviet Union. We had a Marxist regime. So really the purest uh, materialistic uh, education you can, you can get. So I am a somewhat, uh, you know, exceptional case in that I was brought to spirituality and mysticism through laboratory and clinical, clinical work. And it was basically my first uh, psychedelic experience when I volunteered for an LSD session that just opened this whole area completely and answers, you know, unexpectedly. Stangroff was born in Czechoslovakia in 1931, where he grew up with his parents and younger brother, Paul. He was first exposed to LSD as a medical student at Charles University in Prague, when his professor, brain researcher George Rubicek, became interested in studying its effects on brain waves. At that time, Groff was at a crossroads and unclear of his professional direction. And I was in the middle of this crisis where I started questioning whether it was a good choice to become a psychiatrist. And my initial uh, plan was to actually work in animated movies. I like to paint and draw. And when I was finishing uh, what we call gymnasium in Europe, it's the equivalent of high school, I had a, an interview with a leading artist in the animated movie industry. And I was supposed to start working in the Barand of uh, Film Studios in Prague. And just at that time, a friend of mine gave me introductory lectures uh, psychoanalysis, Freud, and I read it overnight and decided in a very short time that, uh, you know, I will move from animated movies to psychoanalysis. This is where, where it was at for me. Uh, so um, at the time when uh, LSD came, I was really questioning the, the choice whether I really should have, uh, should have uh, studied medical school and psychiatry. During that LSD session in 1956, Groff had an experience that profoundly altered his worldview and the course of his life. I took the LSD, and uh, the first part was a combination of beautiful, beautiful, aesthetic kind of uh, fractal, I would, I would call it fractals today, uh, images. At that time I talk about arabesques, or it was like kaleidoscopic images, or like uh, stained glass windows in Gothic cathedrals and so on. And then it also opened into my individual um, history. It was very much sort of uh, like psychoanalysis, only much more profound, uh, sort of seeing connections that I, that I didn't discover in my self-exploration before. Then the research assistant brought him to a dark room. He laid down and she put a strobe light over his head. And my consciousness was just uh, completely catapulted out of my body, and I lost the connection with the place of the experiment, with the, with the research assistant, with the clinic, with Prague, and then with the planet. And then I had the feeling that the, uh, I had absolutely no boundaries. I sort of, you know, became all there was. And then uh, later in that experiment, I was actually in the physical universe, where I actually became somehow the physical universe, and there were sort of things happening for which at the time I didn't have a name. But later I read about the Big Bang, and the black holes, and the white holes, and the wormholes, and so on. While Graf was inside this cosmic display, the research assistant continued following protocol, adjusting the strobe from 2 hertz up to 60. She left it for a while in the alpha and delta range and then turned it off. And then my consciousness started sort of shrinking. And, uh, you know, I reconnected with the, with the planet and then finally found my body. And for quite a while I couldn't actually get my consciousness together. 
with, with my body. And it became absolutely clear to me that what they taught me at the university about consciousness being the product of matter, of the neurophysiological processes in the brain, was just not true. That consciousness was something much bigger and that uh, at least was an equal partner of matter, but possibly supraordinated to matter. I could, at that point, imagine that consciousness could create reality, but I couldn't imagine that, that matter would create consciousness. And then finally I managed to get the two together, consciousness and my body, and uh, obviously I was very impressed. And uh, I realized I was already stuck with psychiatry, and I felt, you know, the most interesting thing you can do when you're a psychiatrist is to study these states. So really, the last, uh, it's now more than 50 years, this was 56, um, I have really done very little uh, professionally that would not be related in one way or another to this non-ordinary state or the, you know, specific subgroup, which I call holotropic. Graf graduated in 1960 and began his clinical work. He was assigned to Prague's Psychiatric Research Institute, which had just launched a psychedelic research center. Among his colleagues was Milos Wojtychowski, and in the early 60s they co-published nearly two dozen papers on their pioneering clinical research, including a three-part study on LSD's clinical history, biochemistry, and pharmacology. So the study of these states became kind of my, you know, profession, vocation, passion, my sort of lifetime commitment. Uh. As he moved up the ranks, Graf's work at the Psychiatric Institute increasingly involved combining LSD with traditional Freudian psychoanalysis, in which he'd earned a PhD in 1965 from the Czech Academy of Sciences. While Graf had found his own psychoanalysis fascinating, considering the time and money invested, he questioned the results. Uh, my own analysis uh, lasted seven years, and I loved every minute of it, you know, playing with my dreams and finding there was a, there was a deep meaning in every slip of uh, my tongue. Uh, but if you ask me, did it change you? I would say, well, you know, I changed during those seven years, but there was no convincing uh, uh, relationship for me between the free associating that I did on the couch and the interpretations and any kind of changes that happened in uh, my life. Whereas uh, when I had my first LSD session, I was one kind of person in the morning and a whole other person in the evening. And there was no question that what happened was, was a result of that of that experience. Graf was convinced that, used responsibly, psychedelics would do for psychiatry what the microscope had done for biology and the telescope for astronomy. But then, the cultural and political thaw in communist Czechoslovakia, known as Prague Spring, came to an end. By the time the Russians rolled into Prague in August 1968, Graf had left for the U.S., first as a research fellow to John Hopkins University and the research unit of the Spring Grove State Hospital in Baltimore, and then chief of psychiatric research at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. There, he headed the last surviving official research project of psychedelic therapy in the United States. When uh, I came to the United States, uh, I used to do, um, besides the work at, at, uh, in Maryland, uh, I used to do uh, workshops at Esalen. And in you know, my, my early workshops, uh, Paul uh, came to me, Paul who was uh, a kind of chronicler uh, at Esalen, who recorded all the, all the seminars and had pretty much a you know, good idea of what was happening in the field. He recorded my seminar and then he said, you know, what you're talking about is very much like what Abe Maslow is talking about and you, you guys should sort of get together and, you know, exchange information. And I really didn't know about Maslow because in, uh, when I was in uh, Czechoslovakia, we had very little contact with the West. I mean, it was even dangerous to have 
you know, too much of an exchange. We couldn't get art currency, we couldn't buy books. We were uh, pretty much limited to reprints that we could ask for and, and got reprints of Western authors and so on. So I didn't know uh, Maslow. But at the time, uh, I had a manuscript which was a very, very thick. Uh, it was, had never been published, uh, or has never been published, but became kind of a five other books. And I sent it to Maslow, and I got a very enthusiastic invitation from him to come see him in Boston, where he was recovering at the time by, after a heart attack. So I got a, an invitation from him and, and uh, flew to Boston to see him. And, uh, and I was, uh, and I rang the bell. Uh, his wife Bertha came to answer the door, and I had the feeling that I was not really welcome, that she was kind of blocking the, the door with her body, you know. And I didn't know, we, we had never met before, so I didn't know what was happening. And then I, Abe and I had, you know, many wonderful hours of exchange, and then when we were having dinner, uh, she finally told me that when he received this manuscript and was reading it and saw this tremendous uh, similarity to his own findings, the peak experiences, spontaneous peak experiences that people had, that he was getting so excited that she was afraid that when we get together, it's going to be so emotional that he could have another heart attack. So that was the reason. Well, I think Stan's going to go, go down in, really in history as one of the great figures in psychiatry of the, of the second half of the 20th century as well as the beginning of the 21st century. He really, uh, in many respects, he, he established that this field, the validity of this field, and, and really, really built a foundation not only in regards to psychedelic research, but another aspect of Stan's contribution, which I don't think is adequately appreciated, is his role in the genesis of the transpersonal psychology movement, uh, particularly his work with psychedelics. So, uh, and Abe invited me then uh, um, to Palo Alto. In the meantime, he got uh, uh, a scholarship when he, from the uh, McLaughlin, uh, foundation. They gave him a house and all he had to do was to to think and, and write. And so he invited me then to participate in several of the meetings uh, involving uh, Tony Sutich himself, uh, uh, Sonia Margulies, uh, Miles Wick, uh, Jim Fediman, in one of these meetings of, uh, also Viktor Frankl. And so we were sort of together talking about transpersonal psychology and formulating, uh, you know, the, the basic principles of it. During these discussions, Maslow and Sutich accepted Groff's suggestion and named the new discipline transpersonal psychology. Soon after, they launched the Association of Transpersonal Psychology and the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology. Uh, so this was very, obviously, very, very important. The interaction with uh, particularly Tony and, uh, and Abe, you know, that led to transpersonal psychology. And then we finally ended up with psychology that we were very pleased with. You know, we felt that this uh, was very culturally sensitive. It didn't make schizophrenics out of, uh, out of the founders of great religions and, and the shamans and so on and also incorporated the uh, challenging observations from consciousness research, psychedelic research and meditation, you know, and other, other areas. But we were facing this major problem that this new psychology uh, was really fundamentally incompatible with what we knew as science, you know, accepted hard science, and it was very vulnerable to such accusations as being flaky, irrational, unprofessional, and so on. And for a while we just didn't know what to do with this. And then uh, I was invited to a party in Francis Vaughan's house in Tiburon, uh, which was basically about the Tao of physics. It was a party for Fritsch of Capra. And we instantly connected there. And I realized that uh, the problem uh, that uh, we were facing is that we were sort of 
uh, trying to reconcile transpersonal psychology with 17th century thinking in basically coming from physics and that physicists themselves, as Fritzsche uh, showed, you know, uh, transcended every single aspect of the Cartesian-Newtonian paradigm in the, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. And that the other disciplines like biology, medicine, and certainly psychology, psychiatry, were still stuck in that old sort of Cartesian-Newtonian thinking. And uh, that what we have to do is to connect it with, the, with this kind of a new paradigm that was coming, that was emerging. In 1973, Groff was asked to join the Esalen Institute as a scholar in residence. He relocated to their property in Big Sur, California, to write, lecture, and give seminars on his work. It was at one of those seminars that he fell in love with a woman who was to become his wife. I met Stan uh, through the great mythologist Joseph Campbell. And I had begun to have non-ordinary experiences spontaneously with the birth of my first child. In 1975, on the heels of a divorce, these experiences accelerated. And um, I decided to go see Joseph Campbell. Christina had studied with him, and they remained friends after college. He said, well, I don't get into experiences. I just study them. But he said, I know somebody who, who knows about these things. His name is Stan Groff. He lives at Esalen Institute in, in uh, California. You ought to go see him. And uh, I met Stan. And he and Jack Cornfield were going to be doing uh, a six-week seminar on Buddhism and Western psychology, and they offered me a, a scholarship to the program. So that was the perfect thing to do, to go and figure out my life and what I was going to do next. And uh, it was in the course of those six weeks that the two of us fell in love. Christina and Stan were married in a small ceremony in Los Gatos on January the 4th, 1978. Zen master Kobun Chino presided as Stan and Christina each took fire from his candle, which represented the divine source, and then connected the two fires together. Michael and Elsie Murphy, Angeli Zarian, and Sonia Margulis were among the witnesses. The thing that really drew me to Stan, uh, beside the personal uh, attraction, was his work and the perspective that he had on non-ordinary states. Um, although I'd never had psychedelics, uh, a lot of the experiences I was having fit into the writing he'd done in, in his first book, Realms of the Human Unconscious. And I just felt as though I needed to know more. And uh, I began to feel uh, a little bit more sane uh, as I was exposed to this groundbreaking work. Well, Stan's work has been just, you know, uh, really has really established the foundation for a field. It, the, the, you know, the, the breadth of it is quite extraordinary. You know, his his actual clinical work with patient populations, his his mapping out a, a you know, really the cartography of the of, of inner states and his uh, his examinations of uh, metaphysics and tying them into other world countries that you know, at various points in time have just been uh, uh, amazing. But for me, most importantly, what uh, was his work, first and foremost, with, with psychedelics. He actually was, uh, during the period that psychedelics were uh, permitted to be researched in the 50s and 60s into the very early 70s, the most prolific researcher in the field. He, he treated thousands of, of patients, all above board, legal, sanctioned, part of, uh, part of rigorous study. It was a very exciting time 
uh, in the whole consciousness movement, um, and especially at Esalen. The co-founder of Esalen, Dick Price, uh, was a risk taker, and he would uh, invite or support our inviting people who were controversial, who were new on the scene, who um, were old and well-known teachers. Stan and Christina created month-long workshops where they would choose a topic or area to explore and invite faculty to teach and do experiential work with the groups. Over the years, they invited many different teachers, including Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, Fritjof Capra, who wrote the Tao of Physics, Rupert Sheldrake, the biologist from England, Brother David Stendelrast, a Benedictine monk who teaches about gratitude, Houston Smith, scholar and author of The Religions of Man. Also invited were Buddhist teacher Jack Cornfield and Tibetan lamas, including Chogim Trungpa and Sogyal Rinpoche. The, the chemistry of bringing all those people together and going into the lodge, the main lodge, um, during lunch or dinner hour and seeing um, those stars in the consciousness movement sitting together with the group members from our groups and other people in the community um, just hanging out and talking and there were ideas zipping back and forth um, all done within this extraordinarily beautiful setting. During this time as psychedelic research was falling out of favor Christina and Stan made an important discovery. We continued during doing these month-long groups as w at Esalen, as well as um, five-day groups and weekends. And we stumbled on something we now call holotropic breathwork, which has been our work for many years. Holotropic breathwork is an experiential approach to self-exploration. The word holotropic means literally moving toward wholeness. With eyes closed and lying on a mat, participants use their own fast breathing and the evocative music in the room to enter a non-ordinary state of consciousness. What began to happen is that we saw and many of the, the, the participants in these workshops would, would see uh, that many of these experiences that people were having fit into the model of the psyche that came out of, a whole, uh, of uh, psychedelic work. And um, that they were very, very similar territories and similar experiences. In fact, we've had people say, this was more powerful than my psychedelic experience. Well, I think one of the most uh, interesting, most exciting uh, observations uh, from uh, the work with holotropic states, with the whole spectrum of whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, psychedelics or the breath work or working with people in spiritual emergencies and so on, is the discovery of what we now refer to as the inner healer. You know, we have the idea in, in traditional uh, psychotherapy is that we should somehow try to understand with our intellect how the psyche functions, why the symptoms emerge, what they mean, and then from our intellectual understanding we come with a technique. Uh, now the, the holotropic uh, strategy is very different. Uh, it's a situation where you use some kind of method that uh, induces the holotropic state, whether it's breathing or, or shamanic drumming or uh, psychedelic, session, uh, psychedelic uh, substances and so on. 
And then once that state uh, emerges, then uh, somehow the, the contents, which have a strong emotional charge, start surfacing uh, spontaneously. There is a higher aspect of you that um, somehow guides this whole, whole process. Over the years in his artwork, Stan has illustrated the archetypal realms of perinatal and transpersonal experience, common to many people in holotropic states. My first awareness that the, that the uh, current map you know, was, was uh, limited was actually gradual, or not so gradual, <laughs> discovery of the perinatal level. But then it, it became combined with the transpersonal. And in, in my own uh, personal his psychedelic history, it actually opened fully into the transpersonal, so that uh, if I would do the session today, I would not have biographical or perinatal experiences. It would all be transpersonal. So where on the perinatal level, I might have experienced an episode of toxicity in the womb and, and experienced the, the, the a reaction of the fetus to this. If I would have that experience today, I would be a fish in a polluted uh, river and getting all kinds of ecological insights or determination, you know, to, uh, to fight for cleaner water and cleaner air and so on. So uh, if we had uh, sort of a, a civilization of uh, individuals who are transformed in this way, uh, we would have a world constitution where protection of environment would be a high priority, protection of life. Uh, aggression would be uh, outlawed as, a, as an acceptable way of solving uh, conflicts or, or, or problems and so on. Uh, uh, so um, I think it's, it's probably our only hope if a sufficient number of people undergo uh, this type of uh, transformation. Stan's work has inspired many, both personally and professionally. I first um, uh, became aware of Stan back in the very early 1970s, uh, during a period of time when I had taken a leave of absence from college. I was working at a, a dream research laboratory in Brooklyn, New York, the Maimonides Dream Research Lab, and one of the associated uh, psychiatrists, uh, Dr. Hermone, uh, asked me to, if I would accompany him to a meeting of the uh, Association of Humanistic Psychology and the keynote speaker on this particular evening was uh, Stan Groff and he spoke about his work at the uh, Spring Grove uh, uh, Research Center, uh, part of the University of Maryland where he was actually treating terminal cancer patients with uh, LSD and DPT, and I was very moved by what I heard. I, I thought this was incredible work he was doing. And really at that point, I became inspired to, uh, to one day do that work myself. Uh, to uh, fast forward a bit uh, to 1980, when I entered the field of psychiatry as a resident uh, in a teaching hospital in Los Angeles, I, I was actually initially very disillusioned with what I found in mainstream psychiatry and was questioning whether to uh, go back to internal medicine or neurology, wondering if my, uh, my early vision had been uh, really just illusory. Uh, I, 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 I then tracked down an address for Stan and wrote him a letter describing my situation, that I was a young physician, had been inspired by his work to go to be a psychedelic researcher, but now is very disillusioned, not only by the lack of opportunity to conduct psychedelic research, but also because the field of psychiatry, I felt, had gotten stuck and was not what I imagined it could have been. Stan wrote back to me, uh, uh, and uh, it was a very encouraging letter, essentially saying that although things look grim for the short term, he was more optimistic for the longer term, that there might come a day when researching psychedelics in an above-board sanctioned manner would once again become feasible, and, uh, and it did. Uh, you know, some uh, uh, 12, 13 years after that, I was able to conduct my first study uh, with, uh, with psychedelics, with a, uh, first a normal volunteer population and later a, a clinical patient population. 
So uh, what we discover in, in psychedelic session is that there is a very significant alternative to the kind of uh, healing philosophy that we have in Western medicine, the allopathic and so on, which is the energetic uh, work. It's kind of, uh, you know, very ironical that uh, we would have to uh, recognize that in, in many ways what the shamans were doing was superior, at least in the, to, uh, to what, what we were doing. Uh, um, that obviously, you know, they don't have the technologies that we have, the imaging, although they have their own kind of imaging as well. But, but I think that whole concept of energetic, uh, energetic medicine is extremely important. I remember when I was in medical school in the late 70s, I presented a review of actually Stan's paper on treating cancer patients to a, uh, to a seminar. We, were, we all had to present a recent research paper. So I presented Stan's paper from the International Journal of Pharmacopsychiatry on treating cancer patients with LSD and DPT, a very, one of the most moving papers I had ever read in the literature, in the scientific literature. And I was met with stony silence by my professors, by my fellow students, no one wanted to talk about it. So I kept my interest to, the, to myself. I continued to read everything I could find. Every month I had a little ritual. This was the days before the internet. So I would go into the medical library at my medical school or the hospitals where I was training. I'd pull out the latest index medicus, turn to lysergic acid diethylamide to see if anything new had been written on psychedelics. And from, from really from the mid 70s until the early 90s, there was virtually nothing. Now, in the early part of the new millennium, the doors are starting to open. I think young investigators who, um, you know, who are willing to st step a bit beyond where the mainstream is at might find a very exciting, rewarding, uh, fulfilling field to, to enter into where they will have the opportunity to treat patients who otherwise might not be reachable. You know, I'm, I'm very excited about the, about the new projects, the fact that there are new researchers coming into it. But uh, a lot of it is really uh, repeating things that, that were done in the past, which is, which is great. Uh, but there are sort of, I think, in new exciting areas that we could go into. Uh, the one that I would be most interested in is uh, effect on creativity, to, to bring people who are really outstanding in their own field and they have been working for a long time on a certain problem and they cannot sort of find the solution. And uh, we have a lot of indication that uh, it's possible in a holotropic state of consciousness to um, break through the, uh, through the barriers, through the limitations of traditional thinking and, and um, you know, get completely new insights. And we have, you know, several examples, uh, contemporary examples, uh, um, because most famous being uh, Francis Crick, who admitted that uh, LSD helped him to, to uh, crack the DNA code. And there's another uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist who said the same. So I think that would be probably the most, most exciting uh, work that we, that we could do. As I think about our relationship and our work together and also Stan's work, which I admire so greatly, um, I've seen he's a very, very loyal person and he's loyal to the work he did with psychedelics. Well, for me, you know, the whole transpersonal area opened as a result of uh, psychedelics. I uh, came uh, into psychiatry equipped with, you know, traditional psychiatry and also psychoanalysis. And uh, that is a very, very narrow model, very superficial. It's not that it's wrong, but it describes a relatively superficial level of the psyche and mistakes it for the, for the whole. Freud once uh, compared the psyche to an iceberg when he discovered the unconscious and said what we thought the psyche was was just like the tip of the iceberg and 
and uh, psychoanalysis is showing that there is this big, big uh, area of the psyche which uh, remains hidden in, in everyday life. And uh, then later when I worked with uh, psychedelics, uh, I could actually uh, sort of uh, reformulate it and say that, you know, whatever psych traditional psychoanalysis discovered is just the tip of the iceberg and what you discover in these holotropic states is the part that has remained hidden even to Freud and most of his followers, with the exception of maybe you know, a couple of them. I've kidded him as he's written these many books. You know, when are you going to write the book that doesn't mention psychedelics in it? It doesn't even mention it in the preface. Um, maybe you get a broader, broader audience that way. Maybe it would be a more popular, widely selling book. And um, as far as I can tell, it's never happened. This has been his passion. Stan was a very powerful role model for me. You know, first and foremost, he was doing this within the system. He was mainstream, above board, and he was speaking out publicly, and he was, I, I felt in many respects, treated with a great deal of respect. He also had, he had the necessary credentials in order to speak out as, as he did, and that was a really important role model for me. Stan was influenced by the work of Albert Hoffman, a Swiss scientist and the first person to synthesize ingest and learn the psychedelic effects of LSD. Hoffman once said, if I am the father of LSD, Stan Groff is the godfather. Well, I had over, over the years, you know, wonderful, wonderful experiences with, uh, with Albert Hoffman, of course, whom I, you know, see as my kind of ultimate spiritual father. I mean, without his discovery, I mean, my life would be very different, both professional and, and personal. In 2007, Stan received the prestigious Vision 97 Havel Award for his scientific work. Václav Havel, the former president of Czechoslovakia, said the award is given to thinkers whose work transcends dominant concepts of knowledge and being and reveals the surprising mysteries of the universe and life in new ways. As far as what's changed over these almost 35 years that we've been together, um, I think if anything, the work with these non-ordinary states, um, whether with psychedelics or with the breath work or in spiritual emergency, um, has, if anything, brought us, brought Stan back to everyday life and how the lessons that he's learned and that we've learned together apply in our everyday life. Kind of the sacredness of the, of the ordinary world, what it's like to be with our grandchild. Um, and to see the world the way she sees it. Um, I think that's the biggest change. And then very personally, the change that between the two of us is that um, our love has become deeper and as we've gotten older. He really did inspire me in many ways to, uh, to pursue this field, and I feel very you know, honored. I feel very privileged that I've been able to, on, on, on a certain level, kind of take the torch and move forward with it and conduct my own research with psychedelics. And one goal I have is to kind of keep the torch aloft until the next generation you know, behind us is ready to, uh, to step forward and to begin their own, their own studies. And I'm very optimistic about the future that this, that this area has a great deal to offer to, uh, to the health of, of individuals, to families, and to the collective. Well, I think that uh, as a culture, we are um, paying a you know, great toll for having lost 
spirituality and, and completely oriented ourselves on the external world. And uh, the fact that we lose spirituality, I think, has led to a destructive and self-destructive way of being in the world to the point that we are th threatening the, the future of, the, of uh, life on the, on the planet. And so I think um, bringing in a, a psychology that not only recognizes spirituality but has uh, technologies where people can actually have supervised, you know, spiritual spiritual experiences. Uh, I think it's extremely important for people individually, but also for for uh, humanity collectively. Stan is a visionary who is just beginning to be recognized by mainstream psychology and psychiatry. He has been a pioneering researcher and explorer of consciousness. He's a prolific writer, publishing over 150 articles and 20 books. His life's work has taken him and Christina around the world. teaching and meeting people. He is truly a global citizen. His contributions will continue to shape what we understand about consciousness.